Hi, hey there. How's it going? All right, so today's broadcast is going to be about FSH and fertility. We're going to lightly cover the topic, but go over what you really need to know um, and what's most important for helping with FSH, whether it's low or too high. So uh, welcome everybody, nice to see you guys. For those of you who are new or watching the replay, my name is Heather Rodriguez. I'm a natural fertility specialist. My company and I help couples who are preparing for conception, uh, those preparing for medical fertility treatment or just a healthier pregnancy. And I share in these classes ways that you can use natural therapies to help the body help balance hormones, help support general fertility, and have a healthier pregnancy. So thank you so much for joining you guys. So FSH FSH levels are, FSH is one of the hormones that are part of your monthly cycle and it's an indicator of a lot of things to do with fertility. So when you get your FSH levels tested, um, a lot of people approach us because they've been told they have high FSH. So a lot of people are saying hi, some people are in 10, some people are in 9. Uh, this is so timely, you just got your very reserve panel back. Okay, great. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So a lot of you, um, this is a topic that's pertinent. You know what your FSH levels are, um, so it's something that may concern you. Okay, so there's a couple different, I'm not going to go into tests too much. You can let your practitioner know or let your practitioner tell you whether or not they believe you have high FSH. It's going to be different during different parts of your cycle, um, just as any other hormone of the of your monthly of your monthly cycle. So generally doctors believe that anything higher than 10 to 15, uh, anything over 10 to 15 may be high. Um, I think it's going to be dependent on where you get your testing done, but that's kind of the general. And this may be an indicator of dim diminished ovarian reserve um, or fertility. And also men can also have high FSH and low FSH as well. Uh, we've had some people that we've worked with, um, with men with low FSH. So generally it's an indicator of it can be an indicator of fertility and kind of what's going on uh, with your body. So, but the thing is your FSH is going to be changing throughout your cycle. So if you're right before your peak, right before ovulation, your numbers could be 30 to 50. So it depends on when your test was taken um, and they would know, you know, your practitioner is going to know the right time to take the test, but it's generally taken three days, um, the beginning three days of your cycle. So you wouldn't do it right before your period because that's going to be a totally different number. So, um, and know that as you get older and when you're, um, yeah, day three. So as you get older, go into your 40s, it's natural for your FSH to get higher. That's one of the indicators of the change of life and that things are shifting. So that's something else that it can kind of tell you. Hey, Lorraine, nice to see you. Um, so it can be a sign of poor, poor ovarian function, polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, it can indicate that menopause has started. It also can be an indicator of low testosterone, um, sperm issues. Sometimes if, um, if, um, a male is having a low sperm count, um, if you're not getting your period or you're not ovulating, this is one of the hormones and one of the numbers that might be useful to you. Now, it's not everything. Some people will come and they're, they're really stressed out because their FSH is a specific number and they're, they're fixated on that. We have to get that number down to this specific number. While it is helpful to know where your FSH levels are, that is one part of a big orchestra. So not all hope is lost and you don't need to totally freak out. It is not everything. It's an indicator. Um, it tells us a lot, but there's a lot that we can do with that information. Okay. Um, so if you have low FSH, that's also an indicator of possible um, issues with pituitary hypothalamus. So the tips and things I'm going to talk about are actually going to help with both because when we approach this with natural therapies, we're not going to give you FSH. We're not going to um, add specific hormones to your body. We're going to help support the systems that produce FSH and help the systems that help to regulate the amounts that are in your body. And also we're going to focus more on helping the areas that are indicating um, that they need more support, such as egg health, sperm health, um, the pituitary, these other areas, and that will show up in the FSH numbers. We don't want to focus on the FSH numbers. We want to focus on the um, areas of the body that are needing more support that are being indicated on that test. Does that make sense? So there's a couple different things that you can do to help support um, healthy hormonal balance overall, but specifically make an impact on the FSH levels. We're going to first talk about food and we're going to then talk about herbs. Um, so the first is going to be essential fatty acids. So 
you need healthy fats in order to produce hormones. It doesn't mean you need to eat huge amounts of fats, but we need to make sure you have essential fatty acids and omega-3 to be eating, or I'm sorry, to be producing healthy amounts of hormones. Um, if you're focusing on eating nuts, seeds, grains, cold water fish, those types of things, you're going to be set. Avocados, you're going to be fine. Um, you can also take a supplement like a cod liver oil or omega-369. Um, those are all great. So EFS, number one. Thanks for the, the notes. That's awesome. Um, the second is going to be sea vegetables and dark greens. So sea vegetables are going to contain iodine, which is very um, nutritious for the body, but they're also very mineral dense. I like to eat my sea vegetables from the main coast um, since the uh, Japanese <laughs> nuclear situation. I try to focus all my um, getting all my sea vegetables from Maine Coast. So sea vegetables, because they contain so many uh, minerals, as well as dark leafy greens, tons of minerals, they're fantastic. So that's kind of like, you know, a given. I talk about those every single time we talk about anything, right? But I always have to say, they're food for the endocrine system. Um, there's also, I don't know if you guys have seen these little seaweed they have like flavorings on them. They come in little packets and they're dry. And they're kind of like you can eat them like chips. Those are really nice too. Um, and then the next is going to be bee pollen. Bee pollen, has anyone here tried bee pollen? Are you familiar with it? Do you like it? Um, bee pollen is a very nutrient dense food. It's in one of our products um, called Bee Alive um, or Bee Power that you can get at the natural food shop. It's there with world jelly. Yes, you've tried it. Um, it's an acquired taste. I personally love the taste of it, but it's like a thousand flowers pushed together is kind of what it tastes like. So bee pollen, it's very nutrient dense again. Um, and it's a way that we're able to get a lot of different compounds, minerals, and vitamins to help the immune system support the body overall. And then my last food type of item is going to be, um, oh wait, we have some questions. You tried your real gel and you liked it. Great. Do you take bee pollen with food or without? However you want. I throw it in my smoothies or I'll just put some um, on my mouth and drink some water in my mouth and drink some water afterwards, whatever works. Um, it's an actual, it's more, it's more of a food than it is a supplement. Um, and then the last is going to be spirulina or any type of green powdered um, drink. So again, we're trying to get tons of minerals into the body and fiber. Um, so these foods are going to help to nourish the system that is going to help regulate your FSH levels amongst all your other hormones. So it's not necessarily that these foods, these specific foods are going to lower your FSH, that it's like this direct connection. These foods are going to support the systems that are responsible within your body to have healthy FSH levels as well as progesterone, estrogen, all these other hormonal levels. So that's the approach we're taking with natural and natural fertility. Um, so herbs, we're going to move on to herbs. Are there any questions before, about the foods before we move on to herbs? All of these foods are um, suggested on top of a natural fertility diet, but these are specific ones that you can start with and you can focus on to um, to get going. So those are just, they're a lot more concentrated. Is it okay to take maca, coq10, and roll jelly at the same time? Yes, that would be fine. Okay, so we're going to jump on to herbs. Does bee propolis work the same? No, bee propolis is not. Um, bees are, I love bees. Bees are amazing. They produce so many different products. One of them is bee pollen, the other is world jelly, and those are two that we use to support fertility. Uh, propolis is a totally different product that the bees make that is a wonderful antibiotic, antiseptic. Uh, they use it to plug any holes within their hive. If they find a dead mouse or they find a mouse in their hive, they will kill the mouse and they will cover it in propolis and push it out of the hive. It's amazing. It's how they keep everything sanitary. So propolis is totally different. Um, but it's something great to have on hand for the winter time if you get lots of colds or you need anything that, that kind of mimics or acts like an antibiotic within the body. Is bee pollen in a live bee power? Yes, it is. It's one of the products in there. You use it for endo. How, what kind of results have you seen from using it uh, for endometriosis? I'm curious. It's very cool. Okay, so on to the herbs. Uh, the first is going to be American ginseng. Is this anything that you guys have taken or that you're familiar with? American ginseng. Is royal jelly high in estrogen? It gives you sore breasts. Royal jelly has, um, has, phytoestrogenic compounds in it, but it doesn't mean it's high in estrogen. So what that means is it's going to go and hit the receptor sites and protect the receptor sites from the chemical estrogens in our, in our environment that are the bad estrogens. So it's not just black and white that it's high in estrogen. It's very protective to make sure that the very strong acting chemical estrogens are not hitting those receptor sites and being absorbed by the body. Um, which is better, world jelly bee pollen, they're totally different. You've been taking it for a month or so. 
cool. I'd, I'd be interested in seeing how uh, what your results are from that. Okay, so American ginseng. American ginseng is one of my favorite herbs. This is great for both men and women. Um, this is a way that you're, it's an adaptogen. So adaptogens have uh, the ability to support the endocrine system. The endocrine system is the system that helps to um, control what hormones are being produced in the body, when they're being produced, when they're being triggered, when we ovulate, when we're stressed. All these different things are hormonally driven. Hormones drive action within the body. And the endocrine system is the system that contains all of these glands that, that secrete and create these hormones. Okay? So adaptogens nourish that system, and, and American ginseng is one of the best ones for that, especially for... Um, men who are experiencing high FSH levels, American ginseng is my go-to for that. Um, and also for women, it's fantastic because it's going to support the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. We talk a lot about the pituitary gland because that's the gland that's going to, it's kind of the air traffic director of when hormones are secreted, how much. Um, so um, American ginseng is an adaptogen. Um, it can help with a lot of different hormones besides FSH. It can help with luteinizing hormone, progesterone, testosterone, if it's needed. It's not going to work like a drug and cause some type of imbalance. It's going to help the overall system to balance itself. Thanks for whoever's taking notes. That's really great. Um, someone's asking, can bee pollen and royal jelly be taken together? Yes, it can. Um, so what else about that? Yeah, so it's going to take for, when it comes to American ginseng, just like any herb that's going to be affecting the hormonal system, it's going to take three months. You'll probably see some results ahead of time of energy, of mental clarity, all these great things that come along with using adaptogens. You might be a little less stressed, um, but, it, but for the hormonal um, results, it's going to take at least three months. So that's the same thing for anything else that we talk about. Um, and it's also low testosterone. This is another fantastic herb. It's one of the herbs I use in MH5, which is our male formula. Um, it's, it's just such a great herb. It can be taken for long periods of time as well because it is an adaptogen. So maca, again, is another adaptogenic herb. So this is an herb that can be used to help to support the endocrine system. Uh, maca works a little bit differently than American ginseng is going to work. Maca is going to specifically help if there's excess estrogen for both men and women. Men can have um, excess estrogen too. We're finding a lot of that happening in our modern day. Um, so that helps, Maca can help with that. It helps with erectile dysfunction. It helps with testosterone production. It can help with uh, progesterone and estrogen balance. It does a lot of different things, but it's doing this because of its action on the endocrine system, not because it actually contains any hormones itself. So that's why I love using herbs. That's why I love um, the natural approach is because we're helping the body to function properly and its best. So we're giving it its food, um, its foods for these specific glands and these part of these areas of the body so that it can do its job. So maca is fantastic for both men and women. And then my last herb before I go into therapies is going to be Vitex. Vitex is um, something that's going to help encourage uh, luteinizing hormone production. It's going to mildly inhibit the release of FSH. Um, it's going to help with increasing progesterone levels. That's kind of the cycle that ends up happening after you use Vitex for a period of time. And again, it's doing this all through um, the pituitary gland. So this is an amazing way uh, to help the body to adapt. It's going to only have all these actions if that's what the body needs. It's not going to have these actions and put you into much progesterone or put your FSH levels out of whack if you already have normal FSH levels. That's the intelligence of these herbs. So those are the three um, herbs that I wanted to talk about for four, four FSH and how that can be supported. So natural therapies, these are great to use in conjunction with the dietary changes and the herbs to get the biggest bang for your buck. And natural therapies have a direct action, can have a direct action on FSH levels, but the bigger picture of hormonal balance because a lot of these therapies are gonna help to improve the communication loop. Um, it's called, excuse me, it's called the feedback loop where um, the different organs or the different glands of the body are communicating to each other um, of what hormones to release and when. So the first is going to be acupuncture. Acupuncture has plenty of studies um, that show that it's going to help with this function within the um, hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the ovarian access. That's the access we want the communication loop to be awesome. So acupuncture. Um, the next is going to be fertility massage. Massage, um, Massaging the ovaries helps with that communication loop as well. You can do self-fertility massage. You can find a fertility massage therapist. Uh, you can find a Mercier therapist. 
There's a lot of different options for you with that. Um, the next is going to be to protect um, and promote hormonal balance. And this is done through supporting the liver. So always doing something for your liver, whether it's eating more fiber, using herbs such as dandelion root, um, burdock, there's a lot of different milk thistle, um, all of those help to support liver function. So the liver is getting rid of excess hormones in the body. That is one of the liver's main, main jobs. So doing something for your liver. Also eating bitter foods, um, that can be supportive as well. Uh, and then the last is going to be to maintain a healthy weight. They have found that women who are 10% below their um, ideal weight uh, will have low FSH levels. And women who are above the healthy weight uh, tend to have higher FSH levels. So that's something else to consider um, if you've tried a lot of things and you haven't quite seen a shift yet. Um, so those are my tips for um, FSH and having a healthy level. Uh, and my biggest one being to look at a bigger picture and know that that's the body communicating to you that there's a larger iceberg under the surface that we need to support. Um, and those are natural ways that you can do it. So if you want some more information on natural fertility therapies and ways that you can support your fertility, please visit naturalfertilityinfo.com. I also have naturalfertilityshop.com where you can find um, a lot of these herbs and different products that we've talked about today.